Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome to the stage the President and General Counsel of the Lincoln Legal Foundation, Joseph Morris, and Secretary of the American Conservative Union, Jameson Campaign. Just direct your feet and the sun is Thank you, fabulous disembodied voice. I guess I'm going first. Uh, I, I, it falls to me to thank Angelo Cotevilla for, for those splendid remarks uh, and for stretching us. Um, I do have to correct the record about something. There's been a lot of bashing, really gratuitous bashing of the left going on tonight. And you've been talking about their half-truths, their factual errors, their downright falsehoods, and so forth. You even have somebody, Emily Zanotti, who's going to be cataloging, identifying, exposing it. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. But you must at least allow that the left, including the eco-neurotics among them, have, have a certain consistency and courage of their convictions. They take that trash and they recycle it. <laughs> I am here with Jameson Campaign to recognize a very important American friend of liberty, of the, Heritage, of, of the Heartland Institute and of liberty across the land. This act on the part of the Heartland Institute in according this recognition each year, or at least many years, is, is something in a very generous spirit that characterizes this organization. You've seen it here tonight in tonight's program. What other organizations invite somebody like Charlie Kirk to introduce himself and his concept of an allied sister organization uh, doing its work in the trenches or in introducing, reminding us of the work of the Hoover Institute, uh, showcasing a, a thinker like Angelo Cotevilla, or showing us that there are state legislators in Illinois, like Tom Morrison, who are open to ideas, who actually read things or use modern technologies to hear new ideas. That's against the rules of the Illinois General Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, but Tom Morrison is showcased by the Heartland Institute to show that there are public servants, in, even in Illinois, who do that. In that spirit of generosity, the leaders of the Heartland Institute realize that we all, all of us in the freedom movement, stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, one of them was honored last year, Stan Evans, for what was in effect a Lifetime Achievement Award, and it's very sad that shortly after that, Stan passed away. But he, he wasn't able to be here, but he saw the video of the presentation. He understood the respect that was being paid to him and to the work that he had done over the course of his lifetime. Others have been honored over the years, including Walter Williams, for example, for a lifetime of achievement, of con contributions to the freedom movement. And one of those people we honor tonight is smiling Donald J. Devine, who will go home with this Liberty Heartland Award, this award presented by the Heartland Institute in recognition of the contributions that he has made. Over his lifetime, now stretching more than 55 years of activism since the early 1960s in support of conservative and libertarian principles. The pursuit of traditional values through libertarian means, I think as he would like to say. Jameson campaign will talk a little bit about Don's academic background and his, and his contributions to the movement from the days of Young Americans for Freedom to the American Conservative Union in more recent years, I want to tell you a little bit about what he contributed to us as Americans, as taxpayers, during his years of service as the head of the United States Civil Service, the director of the Office of Personnel Management under President Ronald Reagan. It was, to be sure, a thankless task that, as you heard from Joe Bast, earned him the sobriquet from the Washington Post, Reagan's terrible swift sword. I'll never forget the first time I met Don Devine it was in the course of an interview, I had been, I'd been summoned in as he was staffing up the Reagan administration. I was asked to chat with him about becoming the general counsel, the chief lawyer of that office of the civil service system. And he said, what do you know about the law? And responding to Charlie, Charlie Kirk's question, what's September 17th? I reached in my pocket then and now, I have it every day, my, my, my reading. And I said, well, I read this, the Constitution of the United States, every day. There's something in it that's part of my work. He said, there aren't many lawyers like you, are there? Uh, that was a perception on, the, on, on his part of, of what he wanted to do in terms of moving, of achieving change in the directions, the way in which things worked inside the government, taking the Constitution seriously for a change. He presided over the civil service at a time when there were huge transformations afoot. President Reagan was seeking at the same time to reduce the size of government across the board, its reach, its regulatory impact, its costs and at the same time significantly to strengthen America's security and defense posture around the globe. Those are two very important 
goals and quite countervailing pre pressures. And it required a lot of imaginative and creative leadership on the part of the head of the civil service, both to strengthen Americans' defenses, which meant a serious buildup of personnel, the government remained the nation's largest employer, while at the same time reducing employment at the bottom line, meaning achieving significant reductions in controls uh, on the civilian side of the ledger. But that was accomplished. Director Devine, as we called him, inherited the Civil Service Reform Act that was adopted at the very end of Jimmy Carter's presidency, but left unimplemented by the Carter administration. It provided some remarkable new tools for the control of, of government, to bring government under the control of the American people and their elected representatives and presidents. And Director Devine began implementing the Civil Service Reform Act, creating a wave, shock waves, of reforms and changes in the way in which government did business. He reformed the insurance practices of the federal government. He ran Planned Parenthood out of the business of providing government-financed abortions through the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program. He reformed the federal health insurance program. He made the insurance programs uh, uh, actuarially sound. He did that, he did that kind of regulation, by the way, with his pen and his telephone, but not doing it capriciously or arbitrarily, doing it using actual legal authorities that had been vested in the director of the Office of Personnel Management, doing it in, 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 in a consistent manner, in a manner consistent with the Administrative Procedure Act, so that when we were challenged by the unions and by the left and by Congress in the courts, and we were, we won, because he did it systematically, thought, thoughtfully, carefully, and in the right way. Now, I, I, could, I could catalog dozens of reforms of the way government does business that he thought through and that he implemented, and many of which, alas, have been frittered away by subsequent presidents and Congresses of both parties. A lot, of the, a lot of what was accomplished in the Reagan divine years in terms of government management, alas, have atrophied, although some important things remain. But I want to point out one really crucial thing that you will understand immediately that cuts across every financial issue afflicting this country from coast to coast today in ways I think you'll understand very clearly. Now, this accomplishment has a lot of fathers. Director Devine himself will be very uh, 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 quick to say that all the credit I'm about to heap on him, he doesn't deserve. Credit belongs to some academic thinkers, some very courageous legislators, and a guy named Ronald Reagan. But I was there, and I saw it happen, and I know that the crucial person who made it work, who sold it within the administration, who sold it to editorial boards coast to coast, who sold it in congressional offices to staff and congressional leaders, in fact, who sold it at the White House, was Donald J. Devine. This, what I'm about to tell you about would not have happened without this man. Now think. Every day here in Illinois, certainly, in Chicago, in Cook County, in, in, in the state of Illinois, we are conscious of the unfunded liabilities of pension programs. Governments coast to coast are going broke because we have been profligate in funding and paying for and planning and designing pension systems for government bureaucrats. Now you'd think that the United States government is the nation's largest employer with the nation's largest public sector pension system would be leading the pack of pension systems about to go broke. Because in fact, the old United States Civil Service pension system that the Reagan administration inherited from the Carter administration and its predecessors what, ha, had all of the worst flaws, all of the worst design flaws that people coast to coast are suffering from today. But in the early 1980s, thanks to this man, the bullet was bitten. Major reforms were sold to public opinion and to Congress, the selling starting by him inside the administration, to convert the federal retirement system from the, the kind of cash draining and unsustainable system that it had been into a defined contribution system, not a defined benefits plan, but a defined contribution system. Those of you who live in the business world know exactly what I'm talking about and why a defined, defined contribution plan as opposed to a defined benefits plan makes sense and can be sustained. 30 years ago, the third largest unfunded liability in the United States behind Social Security and Medicare was the civil service retirement system. 
Today, the, the unfunded liabilities of the civil, civil service retirement system have been retired over the course of a generation. 30 years ago, that system was replaced by an entirely new federal employee retirement system. He designed it. That is a pay-as-you-go system. You don't hear about the federal government about to go broke because of its unfunded liabilities for retirement, because of the kind of work that Donald J. Devine and his allies in the Reagan administration did. And they did it the right way, out in the open, selling the concepts openly in public, moving the legislation through open debate, not in back rooms, but open debate in public, in editorial boards, on the radio, in television, in letters, columns, and in congressional hearings, winning the votes one by one as necessary to make the necessary reforms. Now that is a model of leadership that builds citizenship, it builds self-government, it builds respect for the rule of law, and it is an explanation, an illustration of how conscientious conservative action in government helps build human liberty and merits the presentation of a Lifetime Achievement Award as such as this, the Heartland Liberty Prize. Jameson. Thank you, Joe. Our award winner tonight, uh, Don Devine, has made himself into three conservatives in one. Uh, first and still, he is a very accomplished uh, s political strategist and executive, as you heard from Joe. Second, uh, shortly after cutting his teeth in Yaff in, in Brooklyn, New York, he became a widely published political scientist of the first rank of extremely important works. Third and finally, after a long, hard struggle to shed himself of his academic writing style, he is now a very insightful uh, political columnist who reaches out beyond the uh, pointy-headed abstract rhetoric of the academy to talk plain truth to what uh, Stan Evans, our awardee last year, called basic Americans. His political skill first emerged when he headed Brooklyn Young Americans for Freedom, then he was elected to the AF National Board at its first national convention in 1962, served for five years at, uh, on the uh, YAF board, Young Americans Freedom Board, and then for several decades, until very recently, on the American Conservative Union Board, a board which was, by the way, <clears throat> as late as 2010, still governed by a group half comprised of former YAF members. So, Charlie, you have a job ahead of you to restock the ACU board. Uh, <clears throat> he, uh, unknown, I had a little chat with him earlier about this, he also uh, fought incredible battles within the Republican Party at the national conventions primarily against the uh, efforts of very sneaky liberals, Rockefeller people and later others, to, uh, who were trying to change the rules uh, to marginalize the rising conservative cadres within the party. He was one of the very most important uh, regional political directors of the Reagan presidential campaigns in 1976-1980. After he earned his PhD from Syracuse University, he became a political science professor at the University of Maryland, eventually publishing nine serious books of political science and writing hundreds of path-breaking academic articles, political quarterlies, and conference presentations. I recommend that you Google Donald Devine and uh, read his resume, for example, which will show up on the first page. Uh, it's a fascinating reading and uh, has many useful links to it for those who want to delve deep into what he's all about. During all his time, he became uh, one of the main proponents with Frank Meyer and Stan Evans, uh, who came to define the American conservative philosophy as fusionism a creed based on the culture of the West, on our 200-year history of the United States, on our founding documents, not a philosophy uh, based on abstract theory or reactionary nostalgia, but a reality-based conservative creed, which is what we're supposed to be all about here. Apart from his most recent, very important book, America's Way Back, uh, Reclaiming Freedom, Tradition, and Conservatism, which you can find at Amazon. One of his most valuable books for anyone involved in a future political administration is this book about how he ran the civil service uh, during Reagan's first term 
which uh, was also titled Reagan's Terrible Swift Sword. The book, in addition to being a great story of warfare, also is a roadmap for anybody, any president and any presidential administration coming in who wants to control and reform the national administrative state of, uh, uh, created by the progressives who, who we've been railing against tonight. Instead of merely presiding over the bureaucracy, as the, did the two Bushes. Finally, uh, Don today lectures to students widely for the Fund for the American Studies and many others, and is creating countless well-grounded future conservative leaders. He writes a powerful, thoughtful, highly readable opinion columns for a general audience. I encourage you to read his books, read his columns, you will, uh, as a result, find yourself truly connected to the vastness of real American conservatism instead of to any of the hyphenated uh, half-vast versions which have attracted themselves to the, attached themselves to the body of the conservative movement, sort of like barnacles. Ever since conservatism emerged from the uh, 1950s, 1970s catacombs era and began winning political majorities. Our winning efforts did create career op uh, paths for these opportunists who have compromised our libertarian conservative fusionist cause by slapping a conservative label on themselves. Don Devine and his full body of academic and political work remain today our best guardian against both the opportunists and of course uh, those of the millenarian social, secular socialist left. So I thank you Don for all you've done for us. Thank you. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, Donald J. Devine. All right, thank you. Uh, it was very flattering. It was pretty much the way we went over it. Uh, uh, it's nice to be here. You got to be somewhere. Uh, and I come from Washington, D.C., so it's really good to be someplace else. Uh, uh, thank you for your kind remarks. Uh, I want to thank especially Joe Best and the Heartland Institute for giving me this award, uh, which really is kind of silly because I just had fun. Uh, I mean, this wasn't any great thing, Joe. I hate to tell you, I didn't really follow those rules like you told me to. Uh, yes, uh, you did. No, yes, you did. no. Um, I have the paperwork to prove it. <laughs> I remember when Ronald Reagan called up and asked me about this job, uh, said, Don, I got a job for you. I said, what is it? He said, Director of the Office of Personnel Management, OPM. My son used to call it opium. Uh, I said, uh, uh, well, that's the head of the civil service. That's kind of a funny job to give to a libertarian type like me. He said, well, I got a good sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> I said, well, what do you want me to do? Uh, and he said, uh, well, I want you to cut the non-defense employees by 100,000. I want you to reduce their bloated benefits. And I want you to make them work harder. I said, thanks a lot. Going to make a lot of friends in this job. But, uh, I always remember what Harry Truman used to say about doing a tough job in Washington, Now, If you need a friend in Washington, buy a dog. So I bought two to be on the safe side. Uh, 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 and the crazy thing about it is that contrary to all of uh, people saying you can't do that, we did it. We did cut 100,000 non-defense employees. Of course, we increased the defense side, but kind of uh, Ronald Reagan won the Cold War with it. But most importantly, as Thatcher said, without committing troops to it, without having to get people killed. Uh, uh, 
We did cut the bloated benefits, uh, even uh, according to the Office of Management and Budget, which hated to give anybody else credit for cutting anything. Uh, uh, they admitted I saved $6.3 billion, which in today's money is over $60 billion. So that's kind of even real money in Washington. Uh, <laughs> And we even did make them work harder. We put through a pay for performance system uh, uh, for the executives and mid-level managers. We put in a performance appraisal system for the whole government. We actually had to make them justify working. Can you imagine such a thing? Uh, now, of course, it wasn't me. I just did what my boss told me to. Uh, uh, nobody thought we could cut uh, the number of employees and make them work harder. Uh, it was impossible. But Ronald Reagan did all kinds of impossible things. Uh, no modern president has cut what we call non-defense discretionary spending, which is what you run the government with, uh, uh, everything but the entitlements. He cut it absolutely by 9.5% over his eight years. Most conservatives and libertarians don't even know that. It's scary. We can cut it if you have people that are determined to do it. He even cut relative, now he cut absolute dollars, not just percentage of any, he cut uh, from 17.3 to 15.4% uh, of uh, 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 gross national product, uh, even including entitlements on the domestic side. Uh, 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 look at the, uh, the economy. We've had only three times in American history where the stock market has lost uh, uh, around 3% of its value over a, a three-day period. 1929, you all know, the uh, Great Depression. Uh, all you uh, know, especially young people, know the present one we're still in. Both of those uh, recession, we use all the great powers of the federal government, and uh, uh, the first one lasted over a decade. Who knows how long this one lasts, uh, uh, depending. The third time, when was that? I give speeches all around the country, economic. Nobody knows when the third one was. All right, he does, because he was there. In 1987, uh, we had the third. In fact, it was the second most, if you carry it out this uh, uh, to uh, decimal points. Uh, third, uh, second largest depression we've had uh, uh, since the, the Great Depression. Ronald Reagan had the same economic people that went up to uh, Franklin Roosevelt and went to uh, 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 George Bush and went to Obama and said, oh, throw the money at it, uh, uh, put more regulations on the economy. Uh, uh, know what he said? He said, no. All right, I, I heard his son, uh, Michael, uh, one time, he expressed it best. You know, my father was president when the stock market has lost uh, uh, as much of its value as it did in the Great Depression. You know what my father did about it? Nothing. And it worked. He, he understood freedom. You can't artificially prop it up because everyone knows you're artificially propping it up. It's got to go down before it can come up. That's what freedom is about. He was a great, great person. 25 years of prosperity followed that man, right up until the, the present disaster. Uh, Of course, all that's gone. Joe mentioned a little about it. Uh, all of the reforms we made in the civil service were gone by the end of George H.W. Bush's uh, uh, change, except the retirement uh, thing which uh, put in law. Uh, it wasn't even done by Democrats. Uh, 
We've gone a long way away from Ronald Reagan. Now, of course, this is a whole different time. What we need to do is develop a country of Ronald Reagan's, uh, uh, as Angelo said so well. I mean, I guarantee you we are not going to be saved by the government. We're not going to be saved by the Republican Party. We're only going to be saved by you and me. At my last cabinet meeting, uh, the president uh, asked me to come there and uh, uh, read the riot act to uh, the cabinet. Uh, and I gave one of the Perot type uh, things with the charts and all that, and embarrassing each one of the, the department heads by showing how they were adding back people uh, after we promised to get rid of them and did get rid of a uh, hundred thousand, they were uh, adding them back. And uh, uh, at the end of my presentation, uh, I was feeling pretty good about uh, this. Uh, uh, President Reagan was absolutely quiet. And I guarantee you in the cabinet room, if the president's quiet, everybody's quiet and start to get nervous. Uh, and he said, you know, I know how hard it is to say no to people that want more things. He said, I know in the reason you're adding back these people onto the, the roles is because everybody's asking you to do it. Nobody comes in and says, give me less. <laughs> you know, governing is very hard. You never have anybody who say cut, who comes into you. He said that and he said, in fact, in my reading, no country has gone this far, and remember this was quite a few years ago, has gone this far down the road away from freedom and has been able to come back. I tell you, now this room is really antsy. Uh, uh, what is he going to say? Uh, of course, I know Ronald Reagan very well. His favorite story was about this optimistic child who everything in the world uh, was great, no matter what happened. Uh, some disaster, he broke his leg, whatever. He just laughed it off, and the mother and father got together one time, and they saying, you know, we got to teach this kid about the real world. It's tough out there. And if he just has this uh, happy duty uh, idea, uh, of life, he'll never make it. So we have to do something about it. And the father says, I don't know what to do, but I'd say we, we don't give him anything for Christmas. And mother says, that's pretty drastic. Uh, I said, well, you got a better idea? She said, no. Well, anyway, comes uh, Christmas, the kid comes running down the stairs. He looks around, there's no presents, there's no food cooking, there's no tree, there's nothing. He, he says to his mom, where is Christmas? It's a Christmas. Where is it? Where's my presents? And she said, well, your father thinks you've got to learn about life. This is a tough world out there. And, uh, and he turns to the father and says, what are you talking about? I mean, this is Christmas. How could you do this? Father says, you're not getting any. Well, you're going to get what's in that room. That's all you're getting, nothing else. Kid opens the door. And the room's full of manure, piled right up to the ceiling. And the uh, kid looks at it and he says, what is this? And dad says, that's what you're getting, manure. The kid all of a sudden looks and all of a sudden he brightens up and a big smile. He runs out into the garage. He comes back in with a shovel and starts shoveling like crazy in the manure. And the father says, what are you, crazy? What are you doing? 
He said, listen, Dad, with all of that manure, there's got to be a pony under there somewhere. <laughs> so I knew this guy was an optimist at heart, all right? So with all this doom in the, in the, in the cabinet uh, room uh, about us not being able to come back, he says, I know how hard this is to come back. But my challenge to you is to come back. And that's my challenge to you. Your job to make America come back. Thanks for having me and giving you this. That's going to be a box from ship to you. You don't need a picture of it or anything.